make Jesus glad and the devil mad. Amen. Let's rejoice. Our Bible's up. Wave them around. Make Jesus glad, the devil mad. And let's say this together. Say, Heavenly Father, I'm grateful for live stream, especially Wednesday night. It's the right time for me to be refreshed in the Word of God. Some of what I hear will be water for what I've already planted, and some will be seed that will bring forth a harvest. In any case, I have the victory in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. All right. Let's turn in our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and we'll read a few verses here, verse starting with verse 7, Paul's writing to the Corinthians and, he's, and to us. And he says in verse 7, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. And for this thing I besought the Lord thrice, three times, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then... I am strong. And so tonight, uh, I want to bring a message entitled, Man's Extremity, God's Opportunity. Man's Extremity, God's Opportunity. So Paul is writing here to the Corinthians, and, <clears throat> you know, the Corinthian church had given place to other self-promoting ministries. You know, they were false teachers that were teaching another gospel. Uh, flowing in another spirit, speaking another Jesus, preaching another Jesus. And so Paul testifies here of the price he paid for his revelations that he taught them. And he talks about the thorn in the flesh. And, uh, you know, I've heard it uh, preached wrong uh, numbers of times over the years. People want to attach uh, the wrong meaning to this word thorn in the flesh. They think it means sickness, disease, poverty. Uh, that type of thing. But uh, he tells you uh, clearly what it is. It's the messenger of Satan, a thorn in the flesh, comma, the messenger of Satan. Uh, and so uh, to buffet him, to uh, harass him, demons stirring up trouble. You know, everywhere that Paul went, uh, there were uh, people that would go ahead and, and come behind and all of that, and they would spread the word about him and persecute him. Uh, everywhere in the Bible that that uh, thorns in the flesh is mentioned, it's talking about people. For instance, I won't read all of them. Numbers 33, 55 is one. Uh, Joshua 23, 13 is another. Judges 2, 3 is another. So there's, there's three witnesses right there, but I'll just give you Numbers 33. Uh, Moses warns the children of Israel. He said, if you do not drive out the inhabitants of your inheritance, if you don't drive them out in, in, in the land, they'll become pricks in your eyes and thorns in your side. In other words, they're going to be your enemies and they're going to give you a lot of trouble. So that this is what he's talking about. He's talking about people that are inflamed by demon powers that were giving him trouble. And uh, why were they uh, given to him? Did God give them give those uh, thorns in the flesh? No, the devil did it. The devil was responsible. And it was because, he said, of the abundance of revelations. You see, revelation is the basis on our faith. Our faith is always built on revelation. So when revelation is preached, your faith is built. So if the devil can get somebody to stop preaching the word and, and get them moved off of the revelation and get uh, baptized in all the trouble, he can stop them. You know, I notice here in the last few weeks, I've been preaching a lot on the overcomer. I've been talking about, uh, you know, uh, the power of uh, overcoming, the power of encouragement. You know, I'm, I'm, 
My aim is to give you ammunition to load in your gospel weapon, <laughs> you know, to put the devil on the run because people are suffering a lot of attacks. They're suffering a lot of persecution. They're suffering a lot of opposition right now. Uh, why? Because we know the devil knows his time is short and he's come with great wrath. So my heart is to give you the ammunition you need to counteract these things. You know, the devil always opposes revelation. You know, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 16, 9, he said, a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries, <laughs> you know. Uh, he said in 1 Thessalonians 2, 18, he said, you know, I wanted to come to you numerous times, but Satan hindered me. Wow, what a statement that Satan hindered uh, Paul from visiting the Thessalonians. So with every promotion, with every uh, answered prayer, with every victory comes greater opposition. And, uh, you know, I like to put it this way. The devil's a good counter puncher, you know, in a boxing match, you know, somebody can throw a good punch and land it, but a good counter puncher, while that punch is being landed, they can throw their own punch. And that's what the devil, he's a master at counter punching. You might, you might knock him down, but he, in the, in the process, he's liable to throw a punch right back at you that you're not prepared for. So, you know, I like what Peter said, first Peter chapter four, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice. See, that's what Paul was doing. He said, "I listen, I gladly suffer these things because I know I'm on the winning side. I know they're temporary. I've got the power. I've got the authority to turn this thing around. I'm not, I'm not the victim here. So <clears throat> here he mentions this, I, I besought the Lord three times. See, it was before he knew the answer. He, you know, all the Bible is progressive revelation. Paul didn't start out knowing what he began to teach here in the epistles. He had to learn it. He had to learn it by revelation. He had to learn it by experience. And so when these people, the Jewish people actually is who they were, they, they, they would come and, and cause all kind of uh, rioting and gossip and trouble. And, and, you know, they would stir up a hornet's nest for him. And he said, I, I prayed three times, Lord, Lord, Take these thorns from me. See, <laughs> he didn't know that God had already given him the power. See, God, God, God has already done everything he's ever going to do about the devil. That's a vain prayer to ask God to do anything else because he sent Jesus to defeat Satan, and he's given us the power. So he could have said it this way. This is, this is the way the Lord heard him pray in that. The Lord heard this. Oh, Lord, you forgot something. Please come back down here and finish what you started and do something about these thorns. <laughs> do something about this, these demons. Do something about this persecution. Do some, Listen, he's done all he's ever going to do. It's up to us. <laughs> and so what did Jesus say in verse 9? He said, my grace is sufficient for thee. He said, my grace is sufficient for thee because my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Now listen, listen to the, the Greek. I'm going to re- Redo the Greek there, his strength, the word strength there means dunamis. It means supernatural power. So what Jesus answered him, he says, my supernatural power is consummated and accomplished in your feebleness. In other words, you know, it, you're not going to get to take any credit for what's going on. You've already got my power. If you'll stand in me and in my power, you can defeat whatever is thrown at you. See, praise God. So he wasn't refusing. He, he, he wasn't trying to tell Paul, oh, well, buck up, son. You're just going to have to suffer. No, he didn't tell him he just had to suffer. He told him that he could overcome it. And so man's extremity is God's opportunity. No matter what you're going through, there's an opportunity for God to get glory as you overcome those things that are thrown at you. And so another way to look at his answer my grace is raised up as a barrier when you lean entirely on my promise through faith. You know, grace is a barrier. Grace is a shield. Grace is, 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 a, is something that will protect you when arrows are flying towards you. Uh, another way he could have answered him, I already burned up those thorns, so appropriate my grace for you through faith. See, your faith is where it is. See, I like Romans chapter 5, verse 2. That's worth 
turning over there. It's just a few pages to the left. Romans 5, verse 2. And uh, this, this, this will get you down the road when things are uh, hot and heavy against you. It says in, in uh, Romans 5, 2, we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. See, that's why Paul could rejoice in the tribulations and trouble and all of that for Christ's sake. Why, what do you mean for Christ's sake? Well, for the gospel's sake. And we're all, we're all going to suffer things for the gospel's sake. But that doesn't mean we have to just bow to that suffering. We can rise above it and get through it and turn it around. So uh, there's nothing more that God can do about it. We have access to this grace or to this barrier or, or this protection through faith. And faith is what you say out of your mouth. Faith is what you believe in your heart. Amen. Man's extremity. It's God's opportunity wherein we stand. Think about that word stand. Let's turn over to Ephesians because the devil's trying to get you to fall. He's trying to get you to get on the ground where you're vulnerable. You know, I mentioned this the other day about uh, uh, be vigilant, be strong, be vigilant for your adversary that as a lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And I was talking about the lion and how they uh, get their prey on the ground. They can't really do much with the prey until they finally weaken them enough to where they can get them on the ground. Once they get the prey on the ground and off its feet, then, you know, it's just a matter of time. They're going to they're gonna choke out the, the prey, they're going to cut off its oxygen, and then they're going to devour. And uh, so, you know, we have to stand up against the devil's attack, and we do it by tapping into God's grace. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. See, it's not about you being uh, determined. It's not about you being strong in yourself. It's not about, you know, it's not about you. It's being strong in the Lord. In other words, the idea that you're in Christ, that the devil hadn't attacked you. He's attacked Christ. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That word power there is the same word as strength. It's, the, it's, it's, it's dunamis. And, uh, and so <clears throat> put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. See, there's that word. word the word stand, that you'll be able to stand against the wiles, the military strategies of the devil. See, you're not going to get down on the ground. You're not going to lay down and let the devil devour you. No, you're going to stand up against him. How do you do that? Being strong in the Lord, being strong in the word, being strong in the spirit, and knowing who you are in Christ, and faith to access this grace wherein we stand up. We're not laying on the ground anymore. Verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual wickedness in the heavenlies. So um, then we should uh, take upon you, wherefore take upon you the whole armor of God, the entire armor of God, that you may be able to withstand, see there's that word withstand, stand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore. See, notice the emphasis on stand, withstand, stand, withstand. That's exactly, you know, here, here Paul in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he's asking God to do something he's already been given the authority to do. God can't stand for you. You're going to have to do some standing. You're going to have to do some believing. You're going to have to do some appropriating. Amen. <laughs> and so you take on the whole armor of God. Then you'll look like who you are. You're in Christ. You look just like Jesus looks. <laughs> And then it says in verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Or, or we could say dialoguing. You know, God, God's prayer is a dialogue. We're not begging God to take something away from us. We're, we're finding out what is the strategy. I'm standing against this evil, and I'm not going to give in. What's the strategy I need to take? See, that's part of the prayer. Part of the armor of God is to keep you protected until you get the strategy to stand up against the military strategies of the enemy. Amen. 
You know, I recently gave that testimony about uh, having been laid off from a job I had. I was a head of a remodeling company. The owner decided to shut it down, and and uh, and I had, uh, you know, I was laid off. I had no money, and my wife and I had thirty five. After we paid the bills out of that last paycheck, we had thirty five dollars in, in tithes off of it. We had thirty five dollars in the bank, and I had been. Uh, during that time, I had been having a word called promotion. I, I felt like this was a promotion in disguise. That's what I, how I called it, what I called it. My wife got some encouragement the very next service from, from the Holy Ghost at Lakewood Church. My pastor, John Osteen, prophesied over, built her up so she could get an agreement with me. So we agreed. And I, and I was really attracted back to get back in the home building business. I'd been out a couple of years, several years. And so I had a I, play, I sat down and I said, now, and God, you know, we're down to $35 and, and uh, I want to sit down here and I want to pray about what can I do to, uh, to get back in the home building business. And, and I won't say the Holy Ghost gave me the plan. I just started thinking, well, I could do something. I could do a step one and then a, 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 an intermediate step and then get into step two. Be honest with you, I, I just didn't have $100,000 faith. I knew it'd take a minimum of a hundred thousand in the bank to get back in the home builder business. First of all, the bank's got to see that cash before they're going to loan me any money. Number two, I don't have a history, a recent history. My recent history is kind of bad. So I'm thinking, what can I do in the meantime? Well, I could, I could have this intermediate where I could deal with banks, which I had done before and clean up some of their inventory that they owned, repair them, make them ready for sale. Sales were starting to happen back then, and there were lots of vacant houses, and I just had this idea that I could go to a bank, and I needed a minimum of $25,000. That, that was my, and I said, you know, we'll give $25 out of the $35 that we have in the bank in the offering, and we'll believe according to Deuteronomy 30 that we'll, God will make us a thousand times more numerous than we had before. So I, I was needing a thousand-fold return. <laughs> And so I'm talking about now, I'm talking about praying with your prayer armor. See, I'd already resisted the, the devil about being discouraged. I'd res resisted the devil about being crushed, being laid off. I didn't have a pity party. I prayed for my wife so she wouldn't have a pity party. And what's next? Well, I need to find out what does God have for me? How is he going to, you know, how is he going to get me out of this mess? What's my, what's my steps to take? So I sat down at my kitchen table and I made a list of things that I could do. And it took 20, I said, you know what? If I had 25,000 cash, I could go to a bank and say, here, I'm in business. Uh, John Griner, Incorporated, uh, you do, do, you know, I'll, I'll fix up your vacant houses and I'll do it for cost plus 10% or something. And that would get my foot in the door with banks. And after I've done that for a season, then I might be able to increase that money into where I could actually have a relationship with some banks and then I could get back in the home building business. My ultimate goal was get back in the home building business. So step one, step two. Now that was just my plan. That was a plan. I had to have something to go on. I want you to, I want you to hear carefully. I mean, listen, we've got to, we've got to have a prayer armor on. And prayer armor is to find out what the strategy is. Prayer is not begging God to do something that we can do. Amen. So, <laughs> so, uh, so I said, all right, so we're going to give that, that, that in the offering. And so at Wednesday night service, we wrote that $25 check and it's gone. And now we've got $10 to our name. <laughs> That's kind of a serious situation to be in. I mean, how long can we last, you know? <laughs> so I went to the Lord in prayer again, again, not begging him. I said, okay, Lord, now what's next? How do I act? my faith. How do I demonstrate that I have faith for this to happen? I, I need step two now. I've, I've put the, I've put uh, an offering in the bank, in the offering, $25. I'm believing you for 25,000. Gladys and I have agreed to that. It's, it's on its way. Now what? I believe in for favor. Someone's going to give me uh, God, you give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over. Shall men give unto your bosom? Somebody somewhere is going to give me 25000 to get this done. Now, what do I do next? And the Holy Ghost gave me three names. He said, I want you to call these three men. 
and ask them to agree with you in prayer for $25,000. Now, you know, this is, you know, this, this the next day after I gave the offering. I mean, in prayer, God answered prayer is a dialogue. And in my spirit, I'm not saying I heard a voice. I just, in my spirit, I heard these three men's names, call them and ask them to agree. I said, Lord, I can't do that. They're going to think I'm trying to get the money from them. They're going to think I'm prophesying money out of their pocket. I I can't be asking people for money. He said, you're not asking them for money. You're asking them to agree and tell them, tell them that I gave you their name and that they would have the faith to believe for that much money. Not everybody has that much faith to believe for $25,000. And I said, okay, Lord. See, I had my doubts, but I obeyed God. And the first person, I told him, now listen, I'm not asking you for the money. I'm asking you for the agreement. God told me that you wouldn't be intimidated by believing for $25,000. And they had blessed that, blessed that first person. Man, they, they kind of liked the idea that God thought about them in that way. And they agreed with me. Person number two agreed with me, same thing. Person number three, I got them on the phone and they wept. They started crying over the phone. Will you come to my house uh, my wife and I want to pray. Well, I, boy, I really witnessed it with this. And to make a long story short, that man wound up being my partner, and not for twenty five thousand. In a matter of about a month, we had a hundred thousand in the bank, and we be, we we started our home building firm together. And I wasn't looking for a partner originally. See, that was God's plan. It wasn't my plan, but I tapped into God's plan. I had a partner, and we started building houses in West University Place. Praise God. You know, so I'm talking about man's extremity is God's opportunity. Listen, I was stretched all the way out. I want you to know, was I sweating bullets? No, no, I wasn't. I wouldn't allow myself to be nervous. I wouldn't allow myself to be hopeless. I wouldn't allow my, everything that came out of my mouth was the word of God. And I look back on those days and I'm telling you, God came through. He'll come through for you. So whatever situation that you face, you know, remember, as I've been saying, the greater one lives in you. He's in there. First John 4, 4, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. He's in there to put you over. He's in there to give you favor. He's in there to give you a strategy on how to overcome every situation because man's extremity. Yeah, maybe you're all the way, you're in your own strength, you're too weak to get anything done, but that's when God's power, that's when God's grace can come in and shield you and bring you into victory. Mm -hmm.